Bible study time and bless the very people of God that have tuned in. They are not here by mistake, but here by divine order of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let a word be imparted that they may be healed, delivered and set free, but also be enriched to be able to fan the flame of fire within them. They stir up that gift that they will receive the word. Then they will go out and make this world better by shining the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're thankful and we give your name the praise in Jesus name. Amen. We want to talk about effective prayer, secret of effective prayer. And you must understand the Bible is filled with many promises, encouragements, illustrations and emphasizes the, the, the power of secret prayer, of effective prayer, the secret of effective prayer. Uh, we've been praying a lot. Uh, you've been praying a lot. People who thought they didn't have a reason to pray have started praying. Uh, and a lot of times we get emails, calls, and, and within discussions, people say, Pastor, how am I supposed to pray? Of what am I supposed to pray for? And we want to be able to give that because it's practical. Everybody goes through it. And let me tell you that your prayer and my prayer may be different, but we are, we are we're praying to the same God. So when we're praying in the name of Jesus, that is our vehicle. He is the perpetuation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The Bible tells us if we ask anything in his name. So we understand that we are working under the uh, paradigm of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means that he's our perpetuation, he's our go-through, he's our advocate, we go through him uh, to get to God. Now, there's no separation, there's God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. It's a tripartite being, which means that the three are one God in three persons. But as we go through this Bible study today, I'm gonna show you that it's more than just words. Anybody can give a word, anybody can use a word, anybody can say a word, but understand this, that you, your words have to be righteous and they have to be effectual. The fervent, uh, effectual prayer of the righteous will avail us much. So we're going to start out with James 5, 16 through 18. James 5, 16 through 18. And it says, confess your faults one to another and pray one to another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. This is the word of God as we're dealing with it today. And it said in James, uh, it had knees that were worn down by his constant habit of kneeling, kneeling in prayer. If so, we have a testimony by man that has proved the secret of effective prayer and the life that we are able to, to say we practice what we preach. So we talk about praying. But notice the statement that he makes in verse 16. The prayer of a righteous man or woman is powerful and effective or availeth much or in other words, it gets results. So the first thing I want to deal with today, uh, letter, uh, number one, there is a kind of prayer which is not always or very rarely effective. There is a kind of prayer which is not always or very rarely effective. The reason this prayer is ineffective and useless is because God does not hear it. Now, David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's the word of God. Now, understand something. God knows all. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. We understand by him being omnipresent, he knows what's going on. But we're talking about in a spiritual realm, you being able to connect to God, not just giving a whole bunch of words. So when we say here, we're talking from a spiritual point, not just from a, a physical manifestation. So if those persons were in the sanctuary in there, they would hear me. That does not mean they're connected to me. So if you hear me or if your heart has iniquity or it's hard or if you are not ready to receive what thus sort that saith the Lord, what you do is put yourself in a situation where God spiritually, spiritually is not uh, required to attend it to thy prayer. So scripture gives us, let me show you what the scripture is. And we're going to deal with uh, uh, Job 27, 8 through 9. 
Job 27, 8 through 9. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained, when God taketh away his soul? Will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? It says, will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Next verse. And it says, oh, oh, will God hear his cry? That's verse 9. That is the wonderful thing that we know about God, that as we talk about God keeping his promises, there's also uh, things that we have to understand that hinders our prayer. It says, well, God, hear our cry. That does not mean God cannot hear in the atmosphere what's going on, but being spiritually disconnected from God, put yourself in a place where your prayers become ineffective when you pray, because it's not, you know, people say, well, I'm going to say in Jesus' name. If you don't know Jesus, I'm not saying he cannot hear you, but there's, I have an earthly father. His name is William Thompson. My father loves me. I have connection with him. Uh, I disappoint my father over the last 50 something years. I'm sure I've disappointed him. Now, understand this. I'm able to call upon his name. I can call my dad his name. I don't even have to call him. You might have to call him William. I can call him daddy. Now, if you called him daddy and I called him daddy, both things he would be able to recognize. But because I'm his son, I'm his son, then therefore, and I have relationship with him, when he hears my voice, he attends it to it the way he needs to. So even if it means that he says no, he still hears my voice. Now, somebody off the street may say, heard me say daddy, say daddy, he's going to say, I don't have relationship with you. I, I, I may even answer you but I'm not going to grant your request because it's ineffective because you're praying to the father. And when you're praying to that father, he's not your father. He's my father. Does that mean that God does not hear sinners? God does hear sinners. If, if so, he wouldn't have heard me or you when we decided to give our life to Jesus Christ. I hear that all. I heard that all my life. I don't believe that God does not hear sinners. I believe that when we talk about it, we need to explain that there's an effectualness or there's a fervency that comes from people who have relationship with him, which means he hears me as his child. That does not mean that he does not hear the voice, the audible voice of that person. And also God knows the heart of the person. But by me being having relationship with him, then it makes it effectual uh, because I'm being faithful to his word and I'm in right relationship with him. So when we talk about righteousness, righteousness means being in right standing with God. That does not mean you always do everything right, but he is able to restore me unto righteousness or put me back into right standing, which gives me the opportunity to call upon God the Father. And he will not only hear, but he will grant my prayer. Now, understand when he grants my prayer, we're going to learn later in the Bible study, granting the prayer does not mean always he's going to do what I want him to do. Granting the prayer is he will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, which means God knows the need rather than uh, knowing necessarily or giving me what I want. All right. So, so I know some may disagree with that, but that's all right. We're going to deal with it. Isaiah 1, 15 through 16. Isaiah 1, 15 through 16. It says, and when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Oh, that's a powerful scripture right there. And it's saying that because your hands are bloody or they're, they're filthy or they are, are filled with sin or filled with evil. That's not just the hands. That's the body. That's the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And understand this is as those things are inside of you. Then what he's saying is, again, audibly, God can always hear. Spiritually, he is not uh, 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 duty bound to be able to grant you anything without having relationship. I know that's hard pill to swallow and some people are going to have a problem with that. But don't take it up with me. Take it up with the word of God. It's, it's, it's in the word. And, and I'm trying to get you to the point where we understand that we're able to confess our faults. We're able to repent of our sins. So, yeah, some of you are saying, well, pastor, what if you are you, you got people who are saved who still sin? We never said we didn't. 
However, we have an advocate with the father and we have a right to be able to ask that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which gives us the, the vehicle. It gives us not only the vehicle, but it gives us the avenue to be able to go back to him and he restores us. All right. So as we deal with that, I also want to deal with one more scripture. I want to deal with Luke 18, 11 through 12. Let's deal with Luke 18, 11 through 12. The Pharisees, too, and this is for people who say that's Old Testament scriptures you were reading. That don't count. Well, listen, that ain't true, but let's deal with the uh, New Testament. The Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee, and I am not as other men are, extorters, just adulterers, as even this publican. I fast, I fast in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, when he does this, he's making a case that he does everything, that he does everything right. So when he gives that thing, he's saying that I give all that I'm supposed to. But yet he therefore didn't have true relationship with the father. So it, it sounds nice. It sounds real good. But when you're out of the will of God, you hinder your prayer. When you uh, uh, continue to hold up great standards of the world, but yet you don't do the things of God, you put yourself in a position where God, you know, he said it before. Many of that they would say, Lord, Lord, did not do wonderful works in thy name, did not cast out demons in thy name. He said, I never knew who you were. So he's able to use that for his glory. But understand something, your prayers can be hindered. Prayer with a wrong motive cannot be affected. Prayer with a wrong motive. That's number two. Prayer with a wrong motive cannot be effective. And for those of y'all, uh, and I apologize for not telling you this earlier, this Bible study is also on our website because y'all say I talk too fast and I'm trying my best to be able to slow down. But just in case I don't, you can go to simontemple.com and you can download this from your bi for the Bible study and you can get this Bible study and you can follow along with us or you can do some extra study later. But I just want to make sure that you have it. Okay. All right. This is what we're going to do. All right. Now, uh, um, we're going to go uh, to James 4, 3, James 4, 3, James 4, 3. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss. And ye may consume it upon your lust. Let's say it again. Ye ask and ye receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So you receive not because you ask and not only in the wrong way, but you have not cleared the avenue or what you're doing is it's a wrong motive. So you're asking amiss. You're asking for things um, when you ask. And I'm going to use an example. You say, oh, I, I don't like that person. I want them to die. Uh, Lord, let them die. That, that, you, you don't have the power. That, they belong to God. So that's a wrong motive. Uh, Lord, uh, make me rich. Uh, let me go over here and rob this bank and not get caught. That is, God is not going to go against his word. You say, well, pastor, ain't nothing about the bank and the word. The Bible says obey the laws of the land. So robbing a bank is, 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 is not obeying the laws of the land. So God is not going to grant you free passage to be able. That's a BB and T right across the street. You don't have to worry about this. If it get robbed, I ain't do it. So I'm just using this as an example. I'm, I'm on tape and camera, so I got a timestamp. But check this out. Um, if somebody goes over there, and I walk over there and say, Lord, let me get free. Let me go rob this bank and get all their bullion, all their um, coins, all their gold, all their money. And the cameras not see me and I not get caught. God is not going to honor that request. He says, prove me thou will. Bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse. There may be meat in mine house and prove me thou will. Will I not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing? and You have room enough not to receive it. That he did not say that I need to go take it myself. That is a unjust motive by which by way to do it or asking somebody to die, something like that. That is not according. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. But understand something. He's not going to let you go over his word. His word stands supreme. It stands paramount. It is the foundation. So he's not going to transgress his word just to be able to give you what he wants. But he can give you everything you need according to his word. So you've got to understand your motive. Say your motive's got to be right. Your motive's got to be. If somebody's in the room, would you tell them your motive's got to be right? OK, you say, God, make me rich for what? Well, I mean, what is going to make you rich for? 
God, I'm praying, make me rich. Give me overflow and increase. Can you be trusted with the stuff he's giving you now? And I'm not saying God will not do it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is your motive's got to be right so you can flex and floss, so you can show somebody that you've come, started from the bottom, now I'm here. You know, you, you, you can, that, that's a wonderful thing to be able to say, but what are your motives? Are you doing it to increase the kingdom, to be able to be a good steward? It has to be right, okay? If we, number three, uh, if we know of sin in our lives, prayer cannot be effective. If we know, if we know, if sin is in our life, prayer cannot be effective. We learn this from Psalm 66 and 18. Psalm 66 and 18. I, I said it before. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I told you it's not an audible voice. It's a spiritual thing. So that's stuff that's in that is unconfessed sin. You need to confess your faults unto God. You need to be, well, he already know about it. He wants us to confess and repent. He, it, God uh, has a, an awesome, an awesome uh, character where he's a jealous God. And with that, he wants you to be able to repent to him and he will restore you. All right. If any man sin, I said it before. All of us sin and come short of the glory of God. But you have the responsibility as a child of God to be able to repent. So you understand this. If we know sin is in our lives, prayer cannot be effective because you're harboring the sin and you know about it. And you also have to ask God, not only uh, forgive me of the sin I know about, but the sin I don't know about. All right. Omission, commission. Uh, well, if I don't admit it, that don't mean that that means I ain't got to an answer for it. You've got a, the Bible tells in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, if I um, he said uh, um, all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we must give an account for what we have done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. We will give an ultimate account. But for you to be able to have an effective prayer life, you need to be able to say, I'm not going to wait till I die because you don't know when you're going to die. You need to confess your faults and ask for forgiveness daily. Not no, not daily. Hourly, not, not hourly, every minute, every time you think about it, the spirit of God will convict you and you ought to have it in your mind. If you got to put it on your smartphone and remind, repent, repent. And I've been saying it for weeks. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is in hand. I ain't got this all figured out. I don't know um, what's going on in America. Uh, I don't know uh, who uh, God is for. I don't know what's going on. But I know this. Uh, if, 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 if we don't get our stuff right. And if the America, I'm going to tell you, if the government don't get itself right, if the president don't get himself right, if the uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats don't get their self right, if the local government don't get their self right, we're going to see more wrath than we've ever seen before. Because understand, it's, 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 it's an effect or it is a, it's a reciprocation of our sin that we have charged in the atmosphere, that we have put in the ground. The seed has come home. It's like Malcolm X said, the chicken coming home to roost. These are the things that are coming back. So we've got to make sure that when we say, oh, pray for America, the God bless America. God, people worried about who's bowing to a flag. I, I don't care who bowing, who kneeling, who doing whatever. But nobody's talking about submitting to almighty God. Mad at people, mad at sports figures because they getting they kneeling uh, over a physical thing. Yes, I respect the flag. Yes, I respect America. But let me tell you something. I don't hear any of those people and not very few or many of them talking about forget about who's kneeling to a flag or who's standing or who's talking about the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, that's something that's good for us to do. However, how about submitting ourselves to Almighty God? And then we're talking about we're going to pray for America. I pray for America. I pray for our government. I pray for our president. I pray for pastors. I pray for bishops. But understand something for us to be able as America to be able to talk directly to God and see the reciprocation or see the fruits of the labor of our work and of, of our hands and of our prayer, of our effectualness. We're going to have to confess that we are a sinful generation, that we are a sinful world, that America's first sin goes all the way back to sla slavery and don't want to deal with that. A racism oppression, killing one another, races killing each other, folks killing uh, different races. We won't want to go back to that. But like, God, please bless America. When are we going to repent of our sins? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it starts with the individual. And just like I'm saying, I got to pray for everybody else. I pray for myself. And guess what? If you got a, a, a stone to throw, 
uh, that stone will come right back to you because understand your prayer life is personal. It is personal. I cannot depend on nobody in America to be my intercessor. Uh, understand, I can't uh, uh, de depend on anybody in America to be my perpetuation or my advocate. That's Jesus Christ the righteous. So therefore, to him I stand in the fall of, which means I have responsibility to him. So what we need to do as Americans is get our priorities straight and stop lying and tell the truth and tell the truth that, that we need to get a rich and prosperous and effectual prayer life with God. All right. As we go forth, if we if we sin, if we know of sin in our lives, prayer cannot be effective. I want to use another script, scripture here. Uh, I think it's Psalms 51, three through four. Psalms 51 three through four, or uh, let's, go, let's go to one more, let's go to one more. Let's go to uh, 1 John 1, 9. Okay, uh, yeah, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. You hear that? He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteous. Let me, let me say this again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a powerful prayer. We gotta confess it. Not to, I ain't gotta confess it to Joe and John and Sue. I confess it to God, confess our sins. And, and, and also with that, if you know you've wronged your brother or your sister, or you've wronged yourself or your God, especially your God, it's all right to confess that sin. Confess that sin to that brother or that sister. But let me tell you something, you belong to God. Don't let anybody condemn you to hell because of their uh, fleshly inhibitions or their actions where they think that they have a heaven or hell to put you in or they have the power uh, to be able to to say whether you are forgiven or not. I'm forgiven by God, but you got to confess that God knows. So when you talk about God knows your heart, he does. Number four, an unforgiven spirit will hinder prayer. Now, that's unforgiving. Now, this is where a lot of folks may tune off or have a problem because people don't like to talk about people want uh, uh, for folk to forgive them, but they don't want to forgive other people. Then, let me tell you something. Unforgiven prayer is one of the biggest hindrances of people. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, unforgiveness is one of the biggest hindrances to prayer that people don't acknowledge. And we're going to deal with this. Uh, Mark eleven twenty five through 26. Mark 11. 25 through 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. Everybody say it, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you of your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, listen to it now. This is verse 26. You look at it, Mark 11, 26, 25 through 26. But if you do not forgive, Neither will your father, which is in heaven, forgive you of your trespasses. Let's read that all over again. Go to verse 25, baby. Go uh, out of your department. Uh, and when you stand praying, it says forgive. And if you have ought against any, it didn't just say folk you like, but also folk you don't like, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. And it says, but if you do not forgive. Neither will your father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. That's that's powerful people, because understand un, uh, unforgiving spirit will hinder prayer. And we learn this in Mark eleven twenty five through 26 is this possible reason why our prayers are uh, for uh, the conversion of our loved ones and and for the healing of ourselves and loved ones or for the healing of our nation. Maybe, maybe, maybe hindered because we don't forgive. Let me tell you. Ain't nobody in this world that is alive or gone on worth you not having a right relationship with God because you won't forgive. You've got to learn to forgive. And, and pastor, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they treated me. Well, I know a man named Jesus that they crucified, that they buried in a borrowed tomb. But yet he was given by his father to be the, the sacrifice, the lamb for the sins of the whole world. Much less has been done to me and to you. And I know it's hard. You say, I ain't Jesus. But we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Forgiving does not mean that I got to go have dinner. There, there's several people in this world that, that I have, have had forgiven. I've forgiven. And I've also asked them to forgive me. That don't mean none of us going out to dinner together. 
That don't mean that, that uh, we going to, ha going to each other's family reunion or we're going to be friends or anything like that. But I, I hold no hatred in my heart, and I pray they hold no hatred in their heart to me. But the point is, I've forgiven them. And, and when I ask for forgiveness of them, all I can do is put it in, I, I'm the mailman. I put it in the box. If they want to read the mail and receive it, that's up to them. If not, that's on them. So they heap coals of fire on their heads. You've got to learn to forgive. I know I've been pastoring 26 years. And, and I know there's a lot of things that's been done to a lot of people, whether it be uh, racism, whether it be, uh, uh, whether it be oppression, whether it be uh, uh, persons who have been raped, those who have been molested, those who have been done wrong, those who have been shot, killed, uh, whatever. I have a, a member here, uh, well, it's God's member, but, but I happen to be their pastor here at Simon Temple, and their spouse shot, he got shot six times by his spouse. Six times by his spouse. They were in a bad place. They were in a bad part of their life. Uh, neither one of them were living the Christian principles that they should have. And, and he was near death, but he recovered. Because it was a domestic situation, she did very little time. And at that time, he was very bitter and she was very bitter. But let me tell you something. This is a strange thing. How about both of them, even though they're divorced now, and both of them have other spouses, both of them go to this church now. That is just absolutely amazing to me. They talk to one another. They don't go over each other's house, and I can't write no Hallmark story on it or no Harlequin romance story about it. It ain't all like that. But what they've done is made up in their mind that they've got f freedom and peace through Jesus Christ, that I've forgiven. Both of them have done some stuff to each other. They've forgiven. And both of them come, and they don't just come to uh, 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 different services. Sometimes they end up at the same service. And, and, and when I talk to each of them, those things come up in their mind sometimes, but they have the spirit of Christ. You say, well, Reverend, they better than me. No, let me tell you, uh, Jesus is better than you. Jesus is better than me. Jesus is better than them. Jesus will let you forgive some stuff in your heart that your flesh is not ready to let go of. Let me say that again. Jesus will uh, allow you to let some stuff go that's in your heart that your flesh is not ready to let go of, but you got to give it to God and you got to forgive. That's the only way it's going to work. Pastor, I can't forget. Did nobody ask you to forget? I remember everything somebody did to me, most things that people did to me that were wrong, that wronged me. But I had to forgive to be able to go forward. And I want to have a good prayer life. And, and this is what he's saying back in that scripture. If, if you won't forgive your, the trespasses of your neighbor, why should he forgive you? Now, that's powerful right there. And you can say all you want to. I don't care if he don't forgive me. OK, I, I hear you. Uh, during this COVID season, we've learned that death can happen just like that, that sickness and disease can happen just like that. And I don't know about you. Maybe maybe your faith is different than mine. There's been some times over this this last 14, 15, 16 weeks, however long it's been, that I started coughing or something like that. Or, and, I, and I said, oh, what if I got COVID? And then it went into my mind. What could happen to my family? Uh, what would happen to me? You know, and I, and I get things like and I start praying, anointing myself. And I expect God because I pray to him to cover me and protect me. But let, listen to this. If I can't forgive my neighbor, what good is it me to be able to pray unless I pray first, the Lord forgive me. And then, Lord, I forgive them in my heart. See, you've got to have relationship. You've got to have a true relationship with Jesus Christ to be able to get, forgive some people that have done some things to you in your life. I know you tough and you whore and you all all would up and OG'd and all that stuff. Let me tell you something. Something will happen in your life where it's going to take the love of God, the mercy of God, the peace of God for you to let some stuff go. So I want you to right now think about that person that you won't forgive. Think about that thing that you will not, you will not let go of. And now some of y'all say, I forgive everybody. Yeah, but you stink. You got the stankest attitude I've ever seen. You got the stankest motives that you've ever seen. You say you forgive them, but you're really harboring in your heart. And when the spirit of God brings that back to your remembrance, you need to ask God, give me help. Help me to forgive that person. Help me to forgive that person because you never know. You know, I hear people talking about deathbed forgivings and death bed testimonies. You don't know you could be gone just like that. You might not have a chance to be able to do it. So you need to do it today. Amen. Amen. Let me go on with that. Uh, we just lost some viewers on that one. All right. Um, so one, two, three, four. Now we're dealing with number five. Number five. An unwillingness to be reconciled to someone prevents prayer from being effective. 
An unwillingness to be reconciled to someone prevents prayer from being effective. We're going to deal with Matthew 23 through 24. Matthew 23 through 24. Therefore, if you bring thy gift to the altar and there be remembrance that thy brother have ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Now let's go back. I got to deal with that again. Go back to 23. Go back to 23. This is Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and thou rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave thee thy gift before the altar. Go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer any gift. Now, a lot of you may be able to say, well, look, uh, there's no way in the world I can be able to do that because of what they've done to me. But you're bringing your gift. You're bringing your prayer. You're bringing your request to God, but will not forgive your brother. Those of you who cannot forgive then what you have to do is go to thy brother because you won't forgive and be reconciled. Reconciliation does not always mean that we become best friends or friends. It means that I love you with the spirit of Christ. I'm reconciled in it and I'm, I'm able to get that thing off of me. I'm able to have peace with that thing, even if I don't agree with what happened and I'm free from it. Everybody say free. I'm free from it. So it has to be reconciled, reconciled. It is a little used to pray, worship or go to meetings or engage in God's service and expect his blessings of we are unwilling first to be reconciled to another believer, to another believer. Now, understand this. Lightness and dark don't dwell together. That does not mean that those persons are unsaved. I should not be a light in the midst of darkness. But what it does mean, this is what it does mean. This is what it does mean. That if somebody is a believer, I'm supposed to be reconciled with them, even if we can't still have the same relationship. And if I don't have the same relationship with them, that does not mean I don't have God inside of me. I don't have the spirit of God inside of me. That means I have a godly relationship rather than a personal relationship. I think a lot of our problem in the church, church people today, we have a, 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 a horizontal relationship rather than vertical. Understanding this, our vertical relationship is with God, horizontal is with man. So we trust more in this horizontal than we do this vertical. And that's got to stop because when you do that, you set yourself on a course where you care more about what people think rather than what God thinks. When I think what what God thinks, I want to be reconciled with people and have peace. So those other believers, we ought to be reconciled. Um, um, it's just like with pastors. Uh, I, I've made up my mind. I'm not going I'm, I'm not going to go on. Facebook or, or, or Instagram and kill pastors because they don't deal with they don't agree with me just because they don't agree with me don't mean that they're not part of a kingdom. They may have a different understanding. I've learned that I got to be very careful discussing uh, uh, racism, oppression, uh, politics with other pastors. Because especially when they don't see the same way, because a lot of times the conversations I've had over the last three, uh, three months has put me in a situation where some of the pastors that I thought were my friends that we have have, have stopped talking to each other the way we used to. Uh, and it's not because I want to stop talking. It's because something inside of several pastors have made them feel like that because I don't think the way they think because I see oppression and I speak truth to power because I see that there are uh, 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 oppression and there is prejudice and racism, uh, systemic, systemic. Let me tell you, systemic racism does exist. Uh, you can talk about all oh, how we overcome and we can do this and do that. Systemic racism is real. Look it up. If you don't, uh, we, can, we can talk about it. It's real. So since they don't think it exists, they, they don't think I, I should be able to talk about it. But I still have the love of Jesus for them. But in, 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 in the spirit of, of, of the enemy, in the temptation to be able to speak what I want to say sometimes, when posts go up on Facebook or Instagram, my flesh wants to say something contrary or contradictory. And there's nothing wrong with being contradictory. There's a problem when it's going to cause chaos. 
chaos that will hurt the kingdom more than it will be able to build up the body of Christ. So my answer, my question is in my mind, what does this do to further the kingdom? I'm not saying you know me, I'm going to say something, but I got to be careful. Kenny Rogers said it well, it's not biblical, but I think it's true. You got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away, and when to run. That does not mean I don't respond, but so that I don't put that alt between us and we have to reconcile. Sometimes, let me, and I say this, you can quote this today, you can tweet this, you can put this out. Everything don't require a response. Everything and everybody does not require a response. And when you do respond, make sure it is from your, your, your spirit, from your intelligence rather than your flesh, because your flesh will write checks that your hind parts cannot cash. Amen. That's that's free. I threw that in for free because that's something I had to be able to learn myself over the last three months that it, I, I don't want to be able to go and, and cause friction, even though if I say what I need to say, I'm not scared to say it. But I've got to watch what I say and everything and everybody don't require a response. And a lot of people are, are, are unreconciled with their brother and they're believing they still praying, still preaching, still singing, still tithing, doing everything. But they have not reconciled with their brother and it's easy reconciliation, but stubborn. The spirit of stubbornness will put you in a place that sometimes hinders your prayers because you uh, trust more in what your flesh says than what God says. Do you realize that it's hindering your prayer? And when it's hindering your prayer, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. You need to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And when I say that, that don't mean you can't deal with the issue. That don't mean you can't go to your brother, but you got to have a spirit of Christ. Spirit of Christ is in you. There comes a time where you'll be able to talk just about anybody, especially believers. And even if y'all don't agree. So I want y'all in this season to be careful what conversations you have. Are you more worried about winning those souls for Christ or bring biblical understanding? Or are you rather to prove that you're right? And there's nothing wrong. I'm telling you, y'all know me. I'm going to respond. Whether it's George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, both got murdered. I don't care what you say. They ain't died. They murdered. The reason they did die because they were murdered and there's systematic racism in the world. But I have a wonderful charge and a commitment, and I walk worthy of the vocation, which I call is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if all I'm talking about is just that, then I'm not dealing with the whole body. Likewise, if you don't deal with that, you're also not dealing with the whole body. But we've got to preach Jesus. Deal with the issues, but preach Jesus, and be ye reconciled. Be ye reconciled so you can receive the blessings of God. A wrong relationship is a barrier to prayer. A wrong relationship is a barrier to prayer. First Peter 3, 7. First Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto thy wife as unto the weaker vessel. Let me stop right there before some of y'all get excited and start talking about uh, that's my scripture. Let me tell you, weaker vessel does not mean that that person does not have the same anointing. Put that scripture back up. Does not have the same anointing and power as you do. But God has made us in a form. So as man being stronger, a woman being able to be in her capacity when it's a weaker vessel, we are her covering and they are our favor. All right. So don't 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 sit up there and say women, y'all are weak. Now, understand that. That's not what he's saying. As and as being heirs together, heirs together through the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered, that your prayers be not hindered. It said dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto thy wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together, heirs together, heirs of Christ together, in which he makes no difference. There's no male, no female female, no Jew, no Greek. So in the whole uh, steam, uh, uh, scheme of things that your prayers will not be hindered. All right. Thank you. So we understand something that when we come together, that that we a wrong relationship. So I've got to have right relationship with my wife. You got to have right relationship with your husband. We got to have right relationship with our spouse. You cannot treat your your uh, your 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 co-workers and your family members better than you treat your wife or your husband. What is wrong with you? If you were going to do that, you should have left them where they were. That's both of them. You've got to treat that. If I degrade uh, uh, and, and, and cast down and tear down my wife, if you do that to your spouse, whether you be a husband or a wife, because women, you do it too. Men do it too. When you do that, but you can see everybody, hey, hey, how you doing? Praise God. I do anything for you. But you can't do it for your husband or your wife. You got a problem. You hinder your prayers. 
You hinder your prayers with God. Yes, you do. You hinder your prayers because understand something. The Bible tells us, submit ye one unto another as unto the Lord. Submit ye one to another. So we've got to walk in the spirit of unity. We've got to walk in the spirit uh, of holiness as we walk together as heirs of God. So we've got to understand that. And also the next one is there's, however, a kind of prayer which is always effective. There's a kind of prayer that is always effective. We go back to the book of James. Let's go back to the book of James five and we're going to go back, uh, go 17 through 18. And I'm going to read this while we, uh, okay. Uh, When it talks about Elias was a man subject to the passions that were uh, and prayed earnestly, prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by that space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heavens open up. That's that's all I needed that scripture. James tells us it is possible to pray and succeed in gaining God's gracious answer to our prayers. This is the prayer that is powerful and effective. And James goes on to give us an illustration of what prayer can do. And that's in 17 and 18th verse. If we want to discover the secret effective prayer and all that God is willing to do for us and he is able to answer our prayers And he is able to do that for his people. We need to also look at Elijah, a man that was just and like unto us and prove the great power of prayer in an amazing way. And if we look at Elijah, we should ask the question, what can prayer be able to do? Prayer can be effective. But it's got to be earnest. It's got to be effectual. It's got to be with the right motives. It's got to be that we have let our sins uh, be confessed to God. So we've got to make sure that we've reconciled. That brings us to a place where we can have effective prayer. Also, the, the last thing we'll cover, and this will be a part two for next week. Through prayer, God's servants are empowered to speak the word. Through prayer, through prayer. God's servants are empowered to speak the word. First Kings 17, 1. First Kings 17 and 1. And as we deal with this, and it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain three years, but according to my word. That's a powerful scripture. I dealt with some of that on Sunday, I think during our eight, uh, nine o'clock service. You've got to understand this, that 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 through this prayer, through through prayer, God's servants are empowered to speak his word. We have the power to speak it. That's why you got to know the word. We talk about uh, know the truth or know the word, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's know the word of God. You are set true. The truth is not what comes out of your flesh and what you want to get somebody right. Uh, tell, speak the truth and the truth shall set you free. Yeah, but you just cussed them out. You just defiled yourself by cussing them out. That wasn't the truth. That was you. But you use words that does not glorify God to be able to get them straight. And about, don't use that scripture. Don't ever quote that scripture again when you tell somebody off unless you are telling them to be able to edify, admonish or be able to condemn the sin that has been done according to the word, not by what you think. So understand this, you're able to speak the word. So I can say the word says that I'm a more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. That neither death nor life nor uh, nor, uh, principalities or things present or things to come will be able to separate me from the love of Christ. Uh, I may be to speak the word. The word says no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment shall be condemned. That's the way I can speak the word. But if I am praying those things to be able to come to pass, and I don't know the word, I don't have the word in me, how am I going to be able to speak it? Surely it was because Elijah knew that he was standing before the Lord, he was able to stand before the wicked Ahab. It was the prayer in private which made him powerful in public. Now listen listen to this. It was the prayer in private which made him have public powerful prayer. Now understand something. It's what you do in private, that private prayer, which made him be able to speak that powerful word in public. When we turn to the New Testament, we find the same truly that is taught in uh, Acts 4, 29. That's Acts 4 and 29. Because you must understand something, that effective prayer releases the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God's servants are made bold and courageous to speak for the Lord. Let's go to Acts 4 and 29. Acts 4 and 29. And then I'm going to go to 31. I'm going to go all the way up to 32. All right. Acts 4, 29. And now, Lord, 
Behold, thou threatening, and grant unto thy servants that thou with all boldness may speak thy word. Verse 30 tells us, uh, the 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul, neither said any of them that ought of these things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. The word of God, Jesus Christ, was that commonality that allowed them to speak the word with power and in truth. And guess what, saints? You have, I said saints because you're the saints of God. You have the awesome power to speak the word. And I told you faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And when we speak that word, understand something. When we speak that word and we live that word and we pray through that word, we're able to have effective prayer and it will be effective not because just because I'm a pastor don't mean that my prayer is better than yours. Stop running around and trying to find every prayer partner, every uh, person that knows three or four words and can link them together. You've got to know the word of God and you've got to know the worth, the worth, W-R-T-H, the worth of God, which is that God is able. But you can't have these hindrances in your life. When you have those hindrances, you stifle that prayer. Can God still do that and overrule you? Yes, he can. God has the power to be able to do anything. So I don't limit anything to God, but you have to be lined up in his word for it to be able to come in righteousness and be in right standing. So brothers and sisters, uh, brothers and sisters, I just want to say I love you. And I love you with the love of Jesus today. And I want you to continue to hold on to God's unchanging hand. Continue to walk in the authority and spirit of God. And God has a wonderful, wonderful destiny uh, in, in store for you. But we've got to understand, we've got to stop hindering our prayers right now. Be careful with your silly arguments, your silly get backs, your silly uh, forms of being able to show somebody who's right or wrong. There's nothing wrong with being able to speak truth to power and to be able to bring things under subjection by the word of God. But make sure your prayer life is right. And right now, we need prayer in this country. We need prayer in our churches. It's my hope and prayer that the body of Christ, no matter what color, a man, woman, boy, girl, a black, white, Asian, Latino, Native American. I say it all the time. All of us mix with something. You may agree, but you, you ain't even got to call Ancestry.com for that. I can tell you that every one of us mix some kind of way. But most of all, we've got the blood of Jesus Christ. And as long as you've got the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you what, he has power to be able to answer your prayer. So let's pray today, and as we pray, we're praying for that soul out there that wants to get saved. Somebody was touched by this Bible study, and you, you just forgave yourself and forgave somebody, and you say, you know what, I need to give myself uh, to Jesus Christ so the Lord can hear my prayer. I'm asking God to forgive you right now, and I'm going to ask you to receive him into your heart. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, you will be saved. You hear me? You will be saved. And if you pray that prayer, you're saved today. That's what we believe, and we, we hold that true. Also, if you don't have a church home and want to join Simon Temple, log on to simontemple.com or go to in, uh, INF4 at simontemple.com or call us right now at 910-867-1182, extension 5. And one of our prayer counselors and one of our preachers will call you if they're busy. Uh, one of the persons will take a uh, message because they're tied up with other persons who have called in and we will call you back today. You will get a call back within the next 15 minutes and one of our, our preachers will be able to call you. There's 34 preachers here at Simon Temple and we thank God for that support. My wife and I thank God for them. They will, one of them will call you and pray with you and talk about your wonderful choice of salvation. And if you want to join the church, call us also. And we want to thank you. Thank you for this salvation moment. I thank God for the person that just gave their life to Christ. And we welcome you to the kingdom of God and body of Christ. And I thank you for those who have set aside their burdens. They might be able to uh, receive the effectual blessings that you have done by your effectual prayer. Thank you for your support and your giving. You have been faithful and has kept this ministry going and allowed us to be able to, to, to broadcast on many different platforms. We thank you. If you'd like to give, just do so through Cash App or Secure Give or go to SimonTemple.com. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. To next Wednesday, we'll see you. And also on Sunday at 9 and 11, we'll be streaming. And then this evening, we'll be back again at 645. 
tell somebody about it, look at God. 